Hey everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, we are talking about memory uh, in this chapter, and I know I've, I've mentioned it before, this is my very favorite chapter. Uh, I think I love this chapter. Um, and this is also kind of my area of expertise. My dissertation was all about uh, human memory and how it varies across senses. Uh, and so, um, and I also teach a capstone course for our senior uh, psychology majors uh, called memory and it's just a class just about this subject and so I really struggled uh, for this chapter to kind of pare it down um, to one single video um, as I was like looking through the book the book isn't the chapter is not super long um, and so I tried to cover mostly the things that are covered in the chapter which means that I cut out a lot um, and the the disappointing thing about this being a remote asynchronous class where you know you don't have to log into zoom which is nice but the downside is that it loses a little bit of that interactivity and in the memory chapter there's a lot of activities that we could do I will um, I'll, I'll point out um, the exercises that you can try in case you were interested as we go along but for the sake of time I'm probably going to skip over some of those things and just tell you about them uh, so that way this stays um, knock on wood about an hour long instead of about three hours long uh, because I can go on and on and on about this stuff anyways thank you so much for being here uh, I have a lot of videos for you here um, obviously you don't have to watch any of them, except I would say that the one that I would want you to watch, uh, and I'm going to highlight it in just a second, is this one right here, the Clive Waring Interrogate Amnesia. We're going to be talking about him a little bit later today, which is why I, I think this is a nice video to pick up. It's a long video, it's like 40 minutes long, but I only want you to watch maybe the first three minutes of it or so, just to get an idea of what's going on here. But in case you were interested in learning what the Memory Olympics look like, in New York City they, they hold uh, yearly the U.S. Memory Championship. Uh, if you are curious about that, you can find that here. Um, the I think he won five times, maybe more than that. Uh, Nelson Dellis, uh, the memory champion, uh, answers some questions from social media in this one. It's kind of a fun video uh, to see him candidly speak about uh, memory. Uh, here, Claire and Clive Waring, both of these videos feature interrograde amnesia, which is where you can no longer form new memories whatsoever. We'll talk more about that in detail later today. Uh, and then this last video here is Mary Lou Henner, who she's an actor. You may not have seen her recently. Uh, she was more popular in the 80s and 90s, uh, but she has almost a perfect memory. Um, and it's really chilling to see how good it is. Uh, um, like, can remember what she was wearing 30 years ago, you know, if you just ask her right now. Um, really cool stuff, just in case you're interested. Uh, but I wanted to draw your attention to this video, the, the video with Clive Waring, um, because that one, I, I do think it helps to watch that video, the first three minutes or so of it. It looks a little bit like this. Um, and so you're gonna see this guy talk, uh, basically, um, this is a guy who was a uh, conductor living in England. He was actually uh, hired by the royal court to compose and conduct uh, music for them. Uh, so, you know, kind of an elite guy, I guess. Uh, but then he got uh, an infection in his brain and it totally disrupted his ability to form new memories and that's called interrograde amnesia. And so, I'll, I'll play a little bit for this for you here. I've never heard of amnesia. Clive's case became known to millions when a television documentary was made about him in 1986. Alone and confused in hospital, without his memory, the only person he recognized was his wife, Deborah. What's been wrong? Can you just tell me what the illness would be? I mean, I really can't get to this sort of stuff. But I'm I actually conscious now yes. for the first time. I just want to find out what the bloody hell they've been doing, what's been wrong with me. Who so hasn't a fucking clue. Well, this I've never is... seen anyone at all. 20 years later, Clive only has a seven second memory before his mind goes blank. What has life been like for Clive and his family? Do you know that we're making a film about you? No, it's news to me. 
you're being filmed for a television program. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, I thought I'd be posh for it. <laughs> Off a class. Because you're very famous. <laughs> I like this story. <laughs> you're full of jokes, aren't you? Are you two laughing as well? <laughs> about 20 years ago, a film was made about you. Oh, no. Just after you became ill, called A Prisoner of Consciousness. And <laughs> 20 years on, we're making a new film about you because millions of people watched the film and wanted to know how you were. Good heavens. So millions of people know you. How embarrassing. <laughs> Ooh, they know too much about me now, don't they? <laughs> We've been coming to see you for several weeks. I see. Are you paid to come here? Thankfully, we are. <laughs> 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 Clive is 67 and lives in a brain injury unit where he's under constant supervision. His wife Deborah lives 85 miles away in Reading. His illness has made it impossible for them to live together for 20 years. Okay. I'm going to pause it there, uh, but very, very interesting documentary. Um, you get to see a little bit about like having a conversation with him is extremely difficult because he only has about seven minutes of me sorry seconds seconds of memory. Basically, by the time you move on to the next um, uh, 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 sentence, he's already mostly forgotten what you said. Um, so yeah, so this chapter we're going to talk about what exactly happened to him. Why is it he can't form new memories and things like that? This is an example of a diary uh, from 1990. Uh, so this was several years into his um, uh, illness. And this is really chilling stuff, really scary stuff, where you can see, like, for example, at 7.46 a.m., he says, I am awake for the first conscious time. 7.47 a.m., this illness has been like death till now, all senses work. And then again at 747, first thought, I love darling Deborah forever. How sweet. That's his wife. Um, 751, first conscious stroll. 807, I am, and then he has crossed out totally perceptively awake first time. You see he crosses that out because 30 minutes later, now I am really completely awake, except he's crossed out com really and completely. Um, why is he crossing that out? Because as he's going through this, he's seeing this and he's like, I have no conscious memory of that. So he's striking it from the record. Um, yeah, so you can, you can see that he's now, you know, l at noon almost. I am perfectly, completely awake for the first time. And then down here around one o'clock, time for walk. And he says first conscious walk, but he's already said that up here. Um, all right, so really interesting, scary stuff, um, and we'll talk more about Clive a little bit later today. So what are we talking about today? We're going to be talking about how memory functions. We're going to be talking about the different parts of the brain that are active during memory. We'll talk about what happens when memory goes wrong, and we'll talk about what happens when memory goes right. Um, I tried to make this lecture video kind of image heavy, so um, I tried to re re uh, reduce the amount of total text, uh, so that way it'll maybe... Uh, um, I won't be so verbose. But this, uh, this slide uh, is going to tell you a little bit about history, about how we got to where we are now. Um, because in the last, or well, not the last chapter, but two chapters ago, we were talking about behavior. And we were talking about learning. And I talked about behaviorism and how it was really focused on explicit external behaviors that you can directly see and observe and measure. And that was the dominant framework for psychology until about the 1950s, where people started kind of changing the way that they thought about behavior, that it was okay for us to think about internal mechanisms. So behaviorism, which was this idea that really we should be sticking to things like classical conditioning and operant conditioning to explain behavior, that we should only really focus on the external things, that was no longer satisfying uh, to, to people in the field. And, and they kind of believed like, hey, maybe we should start thinking about the internal mechanisms uh, of the brain and try to find ways to systematically study them and measure them. 
Um, so behaviorism was around, and if you weren't behaviorist at this time, then you were probably Freudian. Uh, Freudian, uh, very, very different. Um, you know, we talked about Freud very briefly earlier in the semester. We'll talk about him one or two more times towards the very, very end. But basically, Freud believed that all of our behavior um, can be explained from kind of unmeasurable forces in our in the darkest regions of our brain that are able to communicate and tell us what to do you know so if you are a self-destructive person if you sabotage yourself a lot Freud would say that's because you secretly want to fail um, and so your unconscious drives are causing you to fail so these two kind of uh, styles or frameworks for psychology were, um, were competing with one another uh, and Neither of them were, were really satisfying in terms of helping us understand how memory works. And so part of that, we uh, shifted because of a guy named George Miller. George Miller is uh, the guy who came up with what's called the magical number seven, plus or minus two. I'm sorry, my dog just opened uh, the door. You can see him looking kind of ashamed of himself, sneaking in there. Look at him. Look at him think he's being clever. He's being sneaky. Um, but the magical number seven plus or minus two, this paper came out in 1958, uh, or maybe it's 56, doesn't matter. It was in the mid-50s. Um, basically, the idea is that the human brain can store about seven items in short-term memory at any given point. More than that, and the brain won't remember all of it. Um, but that, that estimate of seven items there's a little bit of wiggle room there. For some of us, it's, a, it's closer to about five items that we can reliably remember. And for some of us, it's up to nine items that we can reli reliably, reliably remember. But this notion that we have this internal limit was really fundamental for getting us to think about behavior uh, and, uh, and psychology in general in a new way. So here is a, a, a more kind of modern con, uh, conception of memory. George Miller talking about the seven plus or minus two. That all really fits right into here in the in this short term memory piece, which you've probably heard of the phrase short term memory before. So basically, here is how we understand memory to work now. That basically we experience the world. So we have sensory input. This can be visual. It can be auditory. It can be taste, touch, smell, so on. Uh, and that information that we experience in the world is going to uh, reach the first parts of our brain which are responsible for sensory memory. If we pay attention to those senses, then they move over to our short-term memory. In our short-term memory, we are able to think about those things and briefly hold on to them. So if I tell you, hey, please remember this phone number, 739-1278. Um, if I ask you to remember that, you probably will rehearse it to yourself. You'll think to yourself, 739-1278, 739-1278, 739-1278. And if you are doing that, what you're doing is you are maintaining that stimulus in your short-term memory. That's called maintenance rehearsal, where you're rehearsing it to yourself. So you're keeping it there in short-term memory. Now, if you do a good job of paying attention to it and of making it meaningful to you, then you have a chance of making that information go from short-term memory to long-term memory. How do you do that? Basically, if you're saying 739-1278, we can turn that into something that's meaningful to us, that we can turn it into, um, uh, or we can repeat it enough so that it sticks with us, that we can remember it tomorrow. That means that we've gotten it into long-term memory and we can retrieve it successfully. So one way to do that would be maybe to write it down, right? So we could write it down and we can look at it and that can help. Um, probably another way um, that, um, hmm, I don't know if this would work, but you know, I just mentioned, you know, trying to make it important to you, trying to make it salient, trying to make it vivid. Uh, and numbers are not usually very good at that. So we might say, all right, 739, how are, how is 739 important? Um, Hmm, let's see, seven is my favorite number, and 39 is uh, how old my sister is. I don't have a sister, but let's just say that I do. Uh, so I can remember 739, and then 1278. Well, 12, because I'm gonna remember 12, because uh, 12 is a dozen, 
in 78 because that is when my mom was born. Uh, and so whenever I need to think of this, I can remember, oh yeah, my lucky number, how old my sister is, a dozen, and my mom's birth year. Uh, and then it's super easy to remember. You probably won't forget it whenever you store it like that. However, as you probably noticed, it takes a little bit of time. It takes a little bit of effort in order for that to happen. And this is why our memories are so bad. Uh, because generally speaking, whenever you're on, like, or I'm not going to say you because I don't want to project onto you. Whenever I, if I'm on social media, if I'm scrolling through emails, or if I'm scrolling through the web, if I'm not really thinking about what I see and thinking about how it's relevant to me and why it's important to me, I'm not going to remember it. And today's um, technology makes that easier than ever, right? Because we have phones and things like that that we can store information for us so that we don't have to remember it ourselves. So yeah, this is something that takes practice. It is something that, that is hard. It is not something that comes easily to us, but that's what it takes for us to really kind of consolidate things into long-term memory where we can then retrieve it later on. This is referred to as the atkinson schifrin model of memory. Uh, it was made popular in 1968 and still mostly widely uh, used today. Um, let's focus on the short-term element of memory because we're going to be talking more about long-term memory. Uh, I want to I drill down on short-term memory for a second. Um, within short-term memory, that's where we have the ability to kind of store things in our mind's eye or our mind's ear. If you've ever heard those, those phrases before where you're able to temporarily store those things. Um, and the definition of short-term memory these days is this. It's your ability to temporarily store and manipulate information uh, from the environment around you. And so anytime you do mental math, that's an example of short-term memory. Because you are, if I say, um, what is seven times two plus three, right? And you try to solve for that, uh, and I take it away, you are thinking about that equation in your mind. Maybe you're looking up to try to imagine it. Uh, you're using mental math. You're using short-term memory. If I ask you, all right, what is this cup right here? You see this cup right here? If I show you this, what do you think is on the other side of it? And if you are imagining what's on the other side, then you're using mental rotation, which is also an element of short-term memory. Anytime you're doing problem solving, you may remember in the thinking and intelligence chapter whenever we were talking about that candle problem um, and you were trying to imagine the ways that you might affix a candle to a wall, that was using short-term memory. But these days, people don't really call it short-term memory, at least in psychology, we usually refer to this as working memory. And the reason why we refer to it as working memory is partly because um, it has smaller pieces inside of uh, inside of short-term memory. So basically you can take short-term memory and you can divide it up even further into smaller pieces. And those pieces are the phonological loop, the visual spatial sketch pad, and the central executive. Um, so generally short-term memory and working memory are interchangeable terms. They mean the same thing. So looking at this, I can just as easily call this working memory and that is totally fine. All right, um, if you're curious about what working memory is, here's a couple of tasks that I rounded up. Um, uh, and actually, now that I think about it, you might not have access to this one. You can try it out, and it, it may ask you for a code. Um, but these others should work. I tested them uh, just a moment ago. Um, so uh, I am going to run through this first one with you. Whenever you click on it, it's going to give you this digit span task. And this will give you, let's see, I'm going to put this down to a span of five. Remember George Miller said that, um, that you can remember four items because it's seven plus or minus two. So, or sorry, five items. So according to George Miller, you should be able to remember this set of numbers. So here we go. Uh, just pay attention right here. And here we go. Remember these numbers, three, two, seven. Eight, seven. All right, so uh, three, two, seven, eight, seven. Is that what it was? Okay, cool. I got it correct. I wasn't even really paying attention. I'm sorry. I was too busy thinking about uh, what what comes up next. So I was able to do this while multitasking, and there's a good chance you probably were too. But if you want to test out to see how well you can do at 
10. Remember 10? George Miller claims that we should not have the ability to remember 10 numbers. So let's try that out. 3, 5, 7, 9, 2, 9, 1, 3, 2, 3. Okay, do you remember those numbers? I don't. I don't, I wish I did. Uh, let's see, if I put in a bunch of nonsense, does that do anything? No, I was hoping it would give me the correct, <laughs> the correct answer. But that's generally, cons you know, that is, would be considered, those 10 numbers would be considered beyond our capacity for short-term memory. And if we wanted to remember those numbers, there is a way to do that. For example, we remember 10 numbers all the time. So if you remember 203-739, one, two, seven, eight. The way that we remember these 10 numbers is that we chunk them together. We make them into units like this. Where now, instead of saying 203-739-1278, we might say 203-739-1278. And if we do that, then we have made this one item, this one item, this one item, and this one item. And hey, what do you know? those four items will fit in your working memory because our working memory can hold up to five items at the at the at the minimum. Whoops, I did not mean to do that. Sorry about that. I'm going to pop right back over to this and show you. So that what we just did, you were probably rehearsing to it to yourself, remembering those numbers. You were using the phonological loop in that case. That means that you were thinking about the sound information. If you want to think about the visual information of short-term memory, here is an example of that. Uh, so uh, here we go. You're going to see um, something here. Try to follow it as it moves around the board. Try to imagine where these pieces go. Here we go. So you got the apple here, 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 here. Now you have to select where those uh, where those boxes were. Sorry, I was not paying attention, so I, I'm going to get this wrong. Yeah, I got it wrong. Um, let me try one more time now that I'm... All right. Boom, 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 boom. Okay. So, if I'm using my short-term working memory for vision, I remember it was here, 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 here. Cool. So, I got that right using these five different placements. You can try it on your own. You can test, see how well you do. Um, but doing this highlights the difference between the phonological loop, which is about hearing sound, sounds that we process auditorily, and sounds that we see, the visual spatial sketch pad. The central executive is going to be the part of your short-term memory that kind of manages these other two, that kind of helps kind of coordinate those pieces. But the interesting thing about this is that these two are independent from one another. So if you are trying to remember a phone number that is auditory, and if so, then that means that that should not interfere with the visual information. Um, it's only if you are trying to remember a phone number and then someone tries to ask you to remember their address, then you're probably not going to do so good because now you're trying to remember two separate lists of auditory information. So um, there are three memory phases that we go through. The first is encoding. This is where you are trying to take that experience and turn it into a memory. There is storage where we are now taking that memory and trying to store it for long-term retrieval. And then there is retrieval, where we are trying to now access and reactivate that memory so that we can pay attention to it again. And if I, I'm just going to go up one more time. I'm going to go back to the Atkinson-Schifrin model because you can see how encoding works from going from point A, where we experience the world, we turn it into a sensation, it goes to short-term memory, and then it goes to long-term memory. That's the process of encoding. Storage is what keeps it here and maintains it here so that it doesn't fade away. And then retrieval is whenever we decide to retrieve something from our memory and that now that we can think about it. So if you think about what you did on your, on your 18th birthday, for example, now you're taking a long-term memory and you're retrieving it and now thinking about it and accessing those, uh, those, those details about it. 
All right. So those are the three memory processes. Uh, and to illustrate how important these processes are, I want you to play a little game with me. Which of these is the actual penny? So do your best. Take a look at these fine pennies here and tell me which of these is the correct one. I love doing this in the classroom because I get usually like five or six different answers and they're all different. I can tell you that usually the most popular ones, this one is usually the most popular. I don't know why. I think because it has a lot of information on it, but it is not uh, the real penny. I get a lot of people saying it's this one and it's not that one, but it's a good guess. The correct one is this one. So this is the correct actual penny. Why do you not know that though? Right? Like that's the conundrum. So why do you not, or I mean, maybe you did get it right, but most people, whenever I show this in the classroom, do not get this right. They don't, they're not able to get the correct penny, which is really weird because you've known what a penny is for all of your life, pretty much, right? Ever since you were a child, you knew what a penny was. I don't know when the last time I held a penny was because we just don't really use pennies all that much in modern society anymore. Um, but I know what they look like. I know what they're worth. I know what they're made of. I know who's on front of it. So why are we bad at remembering which of these is the actual penny? The reason why is because what we use pennies for. What do we use pennies for? We use them to pay for things. So we know what their function is. We know they're worth one cent. Have you ever needed to know what was on the front of a penny? Have you ever needed to know where the word liberty was placed on a penny or where the date was placed or what was inscribed up here? No, you, you haven't needed to unless you are working for the Secret Service who you may know the, the United States Secret Service, not only do they protect the president, but they also um, protect the United States currency. And so anytime there's counterfeiters around who are trying to fake $100 bills, the Secret Service are the folks that deal with that. And so if pennies were very easily counterfeit, then we might know the details of a penny because then it would be important to know, you know, like where the words in God we trust are or where the word liberty is. Um, all right. So let's talk a little bit about why that happens. So whenever we are uh, encoding information, it really depends on how vivid that memory is in terms of how easy it will be to retrieve later on. There are three levels of this. The visual level, the acoustic level, and the semantic level. The visual level is referring to the structure of the, of the item. What does it look like? What are the physical properties of it? The acoustic level, and that's the weakest level of remembering. The acoustic level, which is how it sounds, and the semantic level, which is what it means. If you can remember what something means or why it's important to you and other things you know about, then you are going to be much more likely to remember it versus if you just think about how it sounds or just think about how it looks. For example, if you were trying to remember a phone number, then you're probably not going to remember what it looks like, but you probably will remember what it sounds like because that's a more reliable memory. Um, but if you n attach some kind of meaning to it, then you're gonna, it's going to be an even deeper memory. Here is a, a really fun experiment that was done in the 70s, uh, back when people were first kind of exploring these questions. And they did an incidental learning task. And so basically, and this is one of those that if we were in a classroom, I would love to give you this test before I showed you these results, uh, because it almost always works. Basically, they brought participants in, and they gave them uh, a, a task. And they created three groups. One group of people, they came in, and they looked at a list of words and they were asked, does this word have any uppercase or lowercase letters in it? Yes or no. So that's what they're doing. They're just looking at the words. The second group are asked for the same list of words, does this word rhyme with hat or something like that, you know? So again, they're responding yes or no and they're thinking to themselves, does this sound like blank? And then the third group was asked, does, you know, given, again, given the same list of words, does that word fit into the following sentence? 
the girl ran away and tried to climb a blank. So depending on, and again, both of these groups got the same list of words. None of them were told to remember any of these words, but afterwards they were tested on these. And what we found is that folks that were just thinking about what those words look like only remembered about 10% of those words. Those that remembered or were asked how it sounded remembered about 15% of those words. But those that were asked to think about what that word meant because they were trying to fit it into a sentence remembered almost 25% of those words. And again, none of these groups were asked to remember these words. This is all purely how much they remember from kind of by accident, right? So basically, if you are, uh, and I'll talk about this at the very, very end here, um, if you are studying for an exam, flashcards can be very, very risky because flashcards really promote these first two styles of learning, where you're thinking about how a definition or how an answer looks, or you're thinking about how it sounds so you can repeat it back to yourself. If, you're, if you hear a definition, you're like, oh yeah, that is short-term memory or whatever, that's the answer. Then you're thinking about how it sounds or how that word looks, but you're not thinking necessarily about what its function is, why it's important, how it fits in with everything else from the things you've learned about. So memory is highest when you're thinking about the meaning of an object and not just how it looks or how it sounds. Here was another follow-up study that these same researchers did, and essentially they gave them a list, uh, sorry, a, um, a set of sentences, some which were very simple, like, I went to the bathroom, that would be a simple sentence, and then a complex sentence, which would be, I went to the bathroom, and inside, I saw a lizard. That's a complex sentence because it's more than one clause. Uh, and so what they found is that when people were, were reading these complex sentences, they were more likely to remember the words included in those sentences when it was complex. But why? That doesn't seem to make any sense, right? The reason why is because the more work you put into um, encoding information, the easier you can retrieve it. Um, and that's called elaborate encoding or elaborative encoding, where basically the more, um, I'm trying to think about how I want to describe this, the more work your prefrontal cortex of your brain has to do in encoding that information, the easier it will be down the road in retrieving it. Let's talk a little bit more about retrieval. So retrieval contexts matter. So how well you can retrieve a memory really depends on the context in which you learned about it. And that is maybe one of the big ideas of this chapter, that how easy it is to access a memory depends on the context in which you originally remembered or encoded that information. The closer the retrieval context comes to the encoding context, the easier that memory is to retrieve. We call this fluency in cognitive psychology, that if you are fluent in a memory, it's very, very easy to access. If it is not fluent, then it's hard to access. So in other words, um, if you are studying, um, uh, thinking about flashcards again, if you're studying using flashcards and you just have the definitions from the book on those flashcards, and on the exam, you see a question that is about that definition, but it doesn't use any of the same words to describe it. Usually people find that to be very, very hard, that that would be a really tricky question. The reason for that is because now the context in which you remembered it is very, very different from the context in which you were trying to retrieve it. Um, that's called the encoding specificity principle. So the, 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 the more similar your retrieval methods are to your encoding methods, the easier it is to retrieve that memory. Here is another really fun study, and just by chance, this was done in 1975. I guess in 1975, there was just a lot of memory, uh, research, or a lot of classic memory research uh, being done at the time. This is an awesome study. It's, it is wild, though. It is very, very strange. Basically, these participants, um, and Baddeley, by the way, is the guy who kind of came up with working memory. He's the one that kind of coined the phrase and kind of talked about the visual spatial sketch pad and the phonological loop. So Baddeley is one of the big names in this field. 
basically what he did is he got groups of participants learn a list of words. Some of them learn that list of words on land, and some of them learn that list of words underwater. So yes, there were scuba people involved in this. How fun would that be? You're remembering things underwater? How weird. Uh, so he had four groups overall. One group was learning on land, and then they retrieved that memory, that list. They were asked about that list on land as well. The other group, they learned a list on land, and then they scuba dived underwater and had to recall that list underwater. Another group learned the list underwater and then had to come up on land to retrieve that memory. And the other, and the final group learned underwater and then retrieved it underwater. So based on what we just said, we would expect the highest level of recall to be for these two groups, right? This one and this one. But why? Because the encoding and the retrieval are very close to one another. They're, they're doing it, they learned it on land, they're retrieving it on land, so that memory is probably going to be fluent. For these other two groups, learning on land and retrieving underwater, probably going to have some disruption there, where now the encoding phase and the retrieval phase are very different from one another. So here's where that plays out. And so let's just take a quick look. I know this is really hard. This figure, this graph is really hard to interpret, and I don't know why. So here, this is the groups that learned on land. And the solid bar right here is when they retrieved on land as well. So let's take a look. Yes, they performed very, very well. The land, the encoding on land and retrieving on land did really, really well. Um, if we look at those that um, encoded underwater and retrieved underwater, so those that learned the list underwater and then retrieved it underwater, they are right here, the dashed line. So they are the second highest group. The first highest and the second highest are the groups that had that encoding specificity principle, that where they retrieved the information was very similar to where they encoded it, which is we're going to call context-dependent memory in just a moment. The groups that didn't do so well were these others, those that encoded on land and then retrieved underwater, or those that encoded underwater and then retrieved on land. Those were the lowest. So, um, and this is, like I said, this is called context-dependent memory. State-dependent memory is very, very similar to context-dependent memory, but the difference is that um, it's referring to a physiological state. So if you are thinking about your emotional state as a retrieval cue, that is what we're talking about here. Uh, an example of this would be like, if you are happy, it's very, very easy for you to remember other happy moments from your life. If you are depressed, it's very easy for you to remember other depressing moments from your life. If you are really depressed, it's hard to retrieve those happy memories, right? Because of this, this whole idea that how you retrieve the memory, the closer it was to how you first encoded it, the, the closer those things are, the easier it is for you to retrieve. The further away they are, the harder it is. Which means that if you are studying while you are drunk, then maybe you should take the exam while you are drunk. Because those of you that have ever been drunk before know, and you've been with your friends, you know that, or if you've been high or whatever, if you're over 21, you can do that in Massachusetts. Um, if you've ever been around a group of friends that are high or drunk, what do they want to talk about? other times that they were high or drunk. They would be like, hey, remember that time we went over to Kevin's house and blew up his mailbox or painted his dog green or whatever? Um, so if you are studying for an exam and you're drunk, you should take the exam while you are drunk. And you know that I'm kidding, right? Please know that I'm kidding. Please do not actually do this because I do not want, <laughs> I do not want to get fired because somebody tried to take the exam while they were drunk. Um, but that idea um, can extend to caffeine if you study whenever you have a cup of coffee, then you should take an exam while you have a cup of coffee. If, in thinking about context-dependent memory, if you are taking an exam, especially for you online folks, that if you are watching this video at your kitchen table, then you should probably take the exam at your kitchen table as well. Because, as we'll see at the end of this uh, uh, video, 
um, when we're learning things, we're not just learning what's in this video. We're pairing this information from the video with our context, with the things around us. So maybe whenever you're on the, whenever you're taking the exam, you may not have this video directly in front of you, but you may think like, oh yeah, that knife. I remember I looked at that knife whenever the professor was talking about context-dependent memory, and now I remember. You're using that knife or you're using something from the room around you to help retrieve that memory. Okay, let's talk about memory in the brain. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna quiz you too hard on this uh, because this is one of those things where you know if this was a full memory class or even if this was cognitive psychology we would spend more time talking about these things. But I just wanted to show you kind of how complicated memory can be. Because so far, we've been talking about memory, but we're mostly talking about explicit memory. We're talking about memory for things that happen to us, or memory for, uh, for, for general knowledge. Like, who was the first president of the United States? That's only part of memory. The other part of memory lies in the implicit areas. And these are going to be any kind of memories that can be revealed uh, through an indirect test. I know that sounds really vague, what I mean by that. So an example of this would be like, if, thinking back from chapter six, if your mouth was watering whenever you smelled brownies cooking, that's an example of a memory because your mouth is watering automatically because your body remembers brownies and your body remembers that brownies are good and the last time you smelled this you ate them and so your body's getting ready for this that's an indirect test and it is testing classical conditioning we also have these other forms of learning or of memory like procedural memory which is kind of like muscle memory so like remembering how to tie your shoes or remembering how to tie a tie or remembering how to ride a bike that's an example or how to type on a keyboard that's an example of a procedural memory which is a memory but very very different from what we've been talking about earlier the reason why i bring this up to talk about um uh, the difference between explicit memories, which are memories you can put into words, and implicit memories, which you can't put into words, um, is because these over here, the explicit memories, these require the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is a... Let me try this one more time, because that was chicken scratch. Hippocampus. So the hippocampus is a part of the brain that's going to help us consolidate memories. Um, and if you're not sure what I mean about not being able to put these into words, not being able to put the, you know, to verbalize them, if I were to ask you, whenever you're tying your shoe, which lace goes over the top first whenever, after you make the loop early on when you're tying your shoes? Most people don't know how to answer that without trying to imagine and trying to even doing this with their hands right like imagining tying their shoe so they have to kind of work it out a little bit that's an example of implicit memory because you're not able to easily articulate it out loud you have to rely on your muscle memory for example to remember that and this is also by the way very true for those of you that are musicians um, that can be very hard to kind of put into words what you're doing on an instrument because most of what you've learned is implicit Here's a quick kind of uh, uh, side glance of what's going on in the brain. I already mentioned the prefrontal cortex. This is going to be used a lot for encoding. Um, and the other big player is the hippocampus. This right here, which you can see right here. Um, this is the hippocampus. In just a moment, I'm going to show you what the hippocampus actually looks like. Um, but I'm just going to give you a little bit of a heads up because, after all, it is part of someone's brain it is guts technically right it's part of someone's brain and so you may not want to look at that so if you want to see what a hippocampus looks like i'm going to show it to you for 10 seconds here we go in three two one this is what a hippocampus looks like that was taken out of someone's head and the reason why it's called a hippocampus is because i believe that is latin for seahorse because it looks like a seahorse or a river horse or something like it's something like that um, you can see how, how, how it looks like that. Um, all right, so that's the hippocampus, a huge, really important player in memory. Clive Waring, who we saw in that video early on, does not have a hippocampus. That is why he is unable to create new explicit memories. But you may remember, he was playing piano 
whenever he was um, uh, 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 in in that documentary. So he didn't forget that, right? So why? Because playing piano doesn't necessarily require the hippocampus in order for it to happen. The amygdala, I'll call attention to that too as a, as a big player. The amygdala um, right here, very, very close to the hippocampus, it's kind of the emotional network. Um, so it is the part of our brain that is going to be handling things like emotions like disgust, anger, fear, love, stuff like that. Which is why, partly, um, memories that have some kind of emotional context that are important to us are so easily remembered. There's a very, very easy connection between these two areas. All right, let's talk about some of the problems with memory now. Our textbook cites these seven quote-unquote sins of memory. So the seven sins of memory. I'm not going to ask you to commit these to memory necess necessarily, but I think it can be helpful. Uh, to see basically how uh, we forget things. Um, I think maybe the one that we normally think about, excuse me, as forgetting is transience. And this is also in some places called decay. Basically the idea is that with time, we just ultimately forget things. And why do we forget things? is because we can't access those memories. We lose the ability to retrieve those memories with, with transients. These others though, absent-mindedness, this would be like whenever you forgot something because you weren't paying attention. So sometimes if I'm coming inside and I'm like scrolling through my phone and I set my keys down and I'm continually scrolling through my phone, I may not remember where my keys are because I didn't pay appropriate attention there and so I, I, I don't know where it is. And the other form of forgetting is called blocking, which is where you might have something on the tip of your tongue that's like you just can't access that memory. You can't act, you can't retrieve that memory, but you at least know that you know that memory. So you have some kind of meta awareness that you know that information that is stored in there somewhere. But you so you have a memory that you have the memory, but you can't actually access the memory itself. The other four misattribution we're going to talk about these a little bit later misattribution would, would be like whenever you forget where a memory came from um, for me i have this all the time when i'm teaching in a classroom where i'll be like did i already tell the story to y'all because i remember that i told the story but i don't remember which classroom it was in suggestibility would be like if somebody convinced me that i had already ta told a story before um, they may um, convince me uh, of that memory, which would be suggestibility. Bias would be that someone's belief system is affecting their memory. We, you can think of a lot of easy examples of politics with this, where like, if you um, support one political party, you're going to generally remember all the good things that they did. You're not going to remember the bad things that they did. Um, uh, we can even see this uh, um, looking at, um, I was trying to think about this without, without giving like a controversial um, example, but hey, why not? Uh, so bias, generally when I talk about bias, I don't mean this in terms of like prejudice, but you can think about how this can also play into forming prejudices and stereotypes where if you, uh, or not you, but if someone is prejudiced, if someone is like, let's say, if someone's ageist, let's say, if they um, are prejudiced against people who are older, um, and they uh, know somebody who is older, who dropped the ball on some kind of task at work, they're gonna remember that. And I'm like, yeah, of course they, they, they forgot that. It's because they're old, right? Whereas if I had forgotten the same thing, you may not remember that I had forgotten something because it doesn't fit into your schema of that event. So bias, a little bit harder to talk about, but hopefully both of those examples might give you some insight into that. And finally, persistence, which is also called interference. And this is where you can't get rid of um, memories that seem to intrude on 
uh, on your thinking. Uh, and we see this a lot with, with trauma, with PTSD and things like that, where, or, or uh, intrusive thoughts, where people are trying to remember something, but other memories kind of keep getting in the way uh, so that you can't retrieve those other memories. Here's an example of interference. The book talks about this a little bit, so I want to talk about it too, the difference between proactive and retroactive interference. So this is an example of retroactive interference. Let's say that I learn that your name is Julie, and then you correct me and say like, no, actually my name is Judy. Then in order for me to remember your name, I need to take that name and I need to replace the old one. So I'm overwriting the old memory. That makes it retroactive. We're going back into the past to erase that memory. An example of this in the real world would be, hey, do you remember uh, um, whatever, think of a class you took last semester. If I asked you, if you were to take that final right now, would you make the same grade you did whenever you took it before? Probably not, right? Because a lot of us feel like whenever we get into a new semester, we're starting to overwrite those old memories. We're kind of replacing those old memories with new information. Uh, proactive interference is where we take an old memory and we're replacing new memories with this. So if I call you Julie and you correct me and you say like, no, actually my name's Judy, but I keep calling you Julie, that's an example of proactive interference. And a real world example for me on this to think about proactive interference is parking my car. Um, if you park your car at Stop and Shop, for example, the first time you park there, it's usually pretty easy to find where you are in the parking lot. But if you've been parking there for three years on and off, there's definitely been times where you've walked out of the grocery store and then stopped and been like, oh, shoot, where am I? Right? And you look around and you feel all really silly. Um, that's an example of proactive interference because you have all of these old memories that are interfering with the current memory. So they are old memories that are proactively interfering with the new ones. All right. Um, another way in which we tend to forget things is called the forgetting curve. And this is one of those like big ideas in, in psychology. This was um, brought to us by a German guy named Hermann Ebbinghaus. And Ebbinghaus is usually credited as like the very first memory researcher. The way that he studied these things was very intense. He would like remember a list of 20 items, but all those items were nonsense words that he made. So none of them were actual real words. They were just gibberish. And he was testing to see how well could he remember gibberish over different spans of time. And how quickly could he relearn gibberish if he learned the list and then spent you know a month away from it and then picked it back up how many of those words would he remember of those initial 20 and basically what he found is that human memory is bad is not good so within 24 hours as you can see here we go from remembering everything down to remembering about 50 percent of what we had and actually the estimate is actually a little bit lower than that it's uh around 40 percent but this is not real data it's idealized data to help make the point of the forgetting curve. Because if this drops 50% in the first 24 hours, let's look at what happens in the next 24 hours. So in these 24 hours, from day one to day two now, now we drop from 50% down to, what is that? 35, 38% or so. So here we are dropping 50%. And then we go from 50% to what? let's say 35 is that fair 35 percent and if that's true then that means that that's a 15 percent difference now right so we didn't lose the other half of all that information we didn't even lose 50 percent of that we lost um uh uh 15 percent uh of uh, of that overall 100 percent now um and now we're going from 35 in day two to What's that, about 25 now in day three? So now we've dropped 10%. And if we go from day three to day four, that's the difference between like 25 and, I don't know, let's call this 18%. So that's now 7%. And then from day four to day five, that's like, I don't know, 15%, which is, which I, I don't know, 
I, it's hard to say. That's like 3%, right? So basically what Ebbinghaus found is, I would say, two big ideas. One is that you can guarantee that you are going to forget a lot of information within 24 hours of having studied it. So keep that in mind, especially those of you that are first year, um, uh, um, uh, first year students. Whenever you're studying for an exam, you probably did a really good job of studying things. It's just that your brain, it just naturally is going to forget about half of that information. Um, so pull out every trick in the book you can, right? Try to make that information meaningful to yourself to get it at that semantic level of processing for encoding like we talked about. Um, the second thing that Ebbinghaus emphasizes here is that we forget things more slowly as time goes on. We forget a lot in the first 24 hours, but we forget less and less as time goes on. You can see that this curve is starting to flatten out. So by, week, by day seven, whatever you've remembered there, you're probably going to remember for years now. So that slice of 10% of that week, you're going to remember in the future. That's the stuff that's going to stick with you. So, I don't know. Memory is not so good, but knowing that can be helpful because it means that we should over-prepare over for, uh, for our exams and such. All right, uh, let's talk about Henry Malaisen. Uh, Henry Malaisen, I talked about very, very briefly in a previous chapter. This guy named H.M., I think it was in the biological psychology chapter in chapter 4. Uh, we call him H.M. because for a long time, he was just referred to H.M. In, in the literature. He was a guy who had a surgery done whenever he was very young. And as a result of that said surgery, he was unable to create new memories. So basically, they removed the medial temporal lobe, and inside the medial temporal lobe is the hippocampus. This is how we know... The hippocampus is responsible for memory consolidation. It's because we saw what happens to a guy who loses his hippocampus. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I want to mention here about this specifically. Um, this is, he is also how we know the difference between explicit and implicit memories. That he couldn't remember most things after his surgery, after he had this removed. So every day later, he kept thinking, oh, this is the day that I get my surgery to, to help with my seizures. Um, having forgotten that he got that surgery 30 years ago, 40 years ago even, he, he's, he lived a long life. Um, but he would remember certain other things, like he would remember how to ride a bike, for example. Before his surgery, he didn't know how to ride a bike. After his surgery, they taught him how on the weekends, but he had no memory of how to ride a bike. So, if you put him up on a bike, he'd be able to ride it, no problem. But he would tell you, this is the very first time I've ever ridden a bike. Alright. So, this is referred to as interrogate amnesia. This idea that you can't form new memories. Um, yeah, and I think I described a lot of the stuff. And this really fits with Clive Waring, the video that we saw. Clive Waring has interrograde amnesia. Uh, a very severe case. Um, so basically, they can't remember things that just happened because they don't have a hippocampus to help encode that information and store it for long-term retrieval. This was made into a movie, this idea of interrogate amnesia called Memento, that came out a long time ago. I think it came out in 2000. It's a great movie, though. If you, if you like crime and, and thrillers in your movie, if you like suspenseful mysteries, um, check it out. It's it's the guy who directed Oppenheimer and directed The Dark Knight um, and, and Inception, maybe other movies that you really like. Uh, this is one of his, this is like his first Hollywood movie. Um, it's really, really fascinating and a pretty, pretty accurate depiction of uh, interrogate amnesia while making it an interesting kind of trippy uh, fun movie to watch. Um, all right, I am going to test you real quick here on your memory. Let's see how well you do. I'm going to read a list of words for you, and I'm going to ask you about that list and see how well you remember these these items. Here we go: rest, bed, nap, peace, drowsy, blanket, doze, tired, 
awake, snooze, yawn, slumber, snore, wake, dream. Okay, I'm going to read that list one more time. Rest, bed, nap, peace, drowsy, blanket, doze, tired, awake, snooze, yawn, slumber, snore, wake, and dream. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a couple of uh, questions here. So, did you hear the word, did you hear the word bed? Did you hear the word nightmare? Did you hear the word night? Did you hear the word peanut butter? Did you hear the word sleep? Okay, so let's go with this. Let me just double check my work. Oh, I'm, this is interesting. Okay, here we go. All right, so the word bed, yes, it was in there. The word nightmare, no. The word night, I thought it was in there. It's not actually in there. The word peanut butter, definitely not in there. The word sleep is not in there either. But when I do this in the classroom, I get a sizable chunk of the audience saying they heard the word sleep. Here is a quick list of those words that I just read out. And you will see the word night and sleep are not present in this list. You can do the same thing with these. For this one, the keyword is river. For here, the keyword is doctor. And here the keyword is sleep because all of these other words refer back to each of these concepts and so when you ask somebody were those words present in the list most people will say yes yes it was when in fact it wasn't this is an example of a false memory a very straightforward and, and easy false memory right this is a false memory in the laboratory we'll look at false memories in the real world just a moment but this is called the DRM uh, uh, paradigm, so the Dees Rodiger McDermott uh, paradigm. And the idea is that these words are all kind of associated with one topic. And so as you are kind of um, uh, uh, reading this list uh, or hearing this list, that the word rest and bed and nap and peace and drowsy are all going to help you retrieve the word sleep. One second, y'all. All right, sorry about that, y'all. Uh, so, um, yeah, whenever people study this in the laboratory, generally the idea is that because we have all those words are associated with those singular concepts, that essentially we are also, our, our brain is also retrieving that word that wasn't mentioned in that list. Uh, all right, so why do false memories happen? Some of these things we already talked about a little bit. It could be suggestibility. It could be source monitoring errors where people are mistaking um, uh, uh, where they, they heard something. That can, that can create a false memory where they think something happened a specific way, but it didn't. Um, contextual associations, we just talked about that, about how like if everything is associated with one concept, we have a higher likelihood of also remembering that concept, even if it wasn't present. And then finally, fuzzy trace theory, which is where we have enough retrieval cues that are kind of ambiguous that it kind of re retrieves a memory that, that wasn't there, that was a new memory, where you're kind of putting together um, disparate details. Uh, here is... Oh, 1974, you know, one year before all the other uh, uh, wild memory experiments took place. Um, so, uh, Loftus and Palmer, um, this is another one of those wild, very classic uh, um, research articles where basically they had participants watch a driver's ed video. And you can, you can watch this uh, in either of these videos, they both cover it. But basically, you see these two cars are coming at each other, they hit each other, and then uh, the, these authors asked those individuals after a short delay, how fast were the cars going when they smashed each other? Or they asked, how fast were the cars going when they collided with each other? Or they asked, 
how fast were cars going when they bumped each other? Or they asked, how fast were the cars going when they hit each other? Or finally, how fast were the cars going when they contacted each other? And what the researchers found is that depending on that verb, depending on if they used smashed or collided or bumped or hit or contacted, that changed the estimate for how fast they thought those cars were going. That whenever they were asked how fast were the cars going when they smashed each other, participants said on average 41 miles an hour. When asked how fast were the cars going when they contacted each other, on average people responded 32 miles an hour. And again, these people all saw the exact same footage. The only thing that was different was how they were asked about that event. So keep that in mind next time somebody's asking you about some kind of prior event. Does it seem like they're using language that is, you know, leading? that is biased like these are, because smashed has a very violent connotation, right? Like boom, smash, versus bumped, versus contacted. Those sound much, much less stressful, right? And so we visualize it in our head differently and we'll report a different state of events uh, from that. So this is also called the misinformation effect, how, uh, how information that was presented after the, the memory happened might change the context of that memory and, and, and how you are able to retrieve it. Uh, so language influences our memories and as a lot of these researchers will tell you, this means that memory is reconstructive. And basically what they mean by that is that memory for us, oftentimes, if I'm remembering something from my life, I can feel like, and if it's especially vivid, I feel like I can see it almost like it's a movie, like I can, you know, see everything going along, maybe hear some of the sounds, um, remember the people that were there. But what research shows is that it's usually not a perfect representation. It's not like it was recorded on a video camera in my head. Instead, it is kind of reconstructive that details are present and, and input there that you know they're added that maybe didn't actually happen some of that those details we're gonna forget sometimes um, you may remember something happening but it actually happened to somebody else especially for those of you that have siblings this happens all the time right where you remember something happening to you but then your family tells you no that wasn't you that got into that rollerblading accident that was your brother Steven or whatever um, all right, so how can we make memory better? This is the last little bit here. A couple of things I want to go over. I want to go over the primacy and recency effect. So whenever you're learning a list of words, like you see here, where we got the first word presented in a list here, the 25th word presented here at the very end, what we find is that people are really good at remembering the first few things in the list and are really not so good at remembering the last few, or sorry, and are really good at remembering the last few in the list and not really so good at remembering these things in the middle. I think of this as the grocery store problem because every time I leave the house, trying to remember the gr a list of grocery items up here in my head, I'll remember the first few things that I mentioned and maybe the last few things, but I'll forget a lot of the things in the middle. Um, and so that's the primacy and recency effect. Um, if you want to get good at remembering things, you can try to use a couple of the techniques I'm going to talk about here. The first is mnemonics. Mnemonics are cues that you can use to help you retrieve memories. So think of them as like, as an example, you may remember, that I remember this from U.S. Geography from seventh grade, that if you're trying to remember the five great lakes of America, you can remember this abbreviation, Holmes. H-O-M-E-S. That stands for H is for Huron, O is for Ontario, Ontario, M is for Michigan, E is for Erie, and S is for Superior. So H-O-M-E-S, we're remembering this word, and this word is going to help us retrieve five separate memories. Pretty efficient, right? And that's generally how mnemonics work, where you're taking something that is easy to remember, and you're using it to help you access and retrieve memories that are harder to remember. Here's one of my favorites, um, that uh, kings play chess on funny green stools. 
So if you are taking general bio, you may need to remember the biological biological taxonomy of, of species, which is first we got the kingdom, then we got the phylum, and this the order matters. Then we got the class, then we got the order, then we got the family, then we got the genus, and then we got the species. So if I was trying to remember these seven things in a row, they don't seem to have any kind of specific order that would help me remember that, right? Like you might remember kingdom phylum and then get class and order mixed up, right? So it's important for us to remember the, the order, no pun intended, of these words. And so the way that we can do that is to turn it into a sentence that is vivid and interesting. And if we remember kings play chess on funny green stools, that helps us remember the order in which we can remember K, P, C, O, F, G, S. But like I mentioned at the very beginning of the video, this does require a little bit of work on your end. You do have to make it relevant to yourself. You do have to repeat it to yourself. You do have to pay attention to it. You do have to successfully encode it. And mnemonics can help with that. PEMDAS, very common, you know, um, uh, uh, PEMDAS is very common. Uh, mnemonic that we learn in eighth grade or seventh grade is the order of operations where we remember parentheses exponent multiplication division addition subtraction right the order of operations the order matters we can also use songs and rhymes to do this so the alphabet song is an example of this that when we're growing up and we're trying to learn the order of the alphabet which is completely arbitrary right why is e before f um when you're three years old, in order to remember this, we remember the song, right? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. Uh, we remember that song to help us remember the order. Uh, the quadratic equation song, I don't know if y'all remember this from, college, from, from eighth grade algebra. I do. I remember X equals negative B, X equals negative B, plus or minus the square root of, plus or minus the square root of, square root of B squared minus 4AC, B squared minus 4AC, all over 2a, all over 2a. So basically taking the Frère Jaca, uh song, French song, and putting that equation into it helps me remember this really complex equation uh, for later. So these techniques work because they are retrieval cues that are simple, direct, and efficient, and allow us to retrieve parts of these other memories. The other big mnemonic is referred to as the memory palace. In the memory palace, uh, you may have seen it in movies and TV, sometimes they, they use it there. But the idea is that you can imagine a place that is very familiar to you. Maybe it's the, the, the house you grew up in, in you know, as a kid, or maybe it's your high school. You're, you're imagining the layout, you know, so close your eyes and imagine yourself navigating through, uh, through your childhood home. You walk in through the front door, what's the first thing you see? walk around, you know, walk into each room, you know, mentally, you know, uh, see yourself going into those rooms. And now if you wanted to remember something like the, the, the presidency of the United States in order, then one way to do that is to imagine those presidents in your childhood home and imagine them interacting with the pieces of your childhood home. And if you imagine walking through it a specific way, then you can remember where those presidents are. I did the exact same thing to remember the, the, the presidents of the United States. That's what I use my grad school home for that. For, for remembering the, uh, all of the best picture winners for, us, uh, for the Academy Awards for movies. Of, um, I, I think of um, my grad school basement uh, for, for where my office was there. If I want to remember, um, what else do I got? Uh, <laughs> all the James Bond movies in a row. So like which ones came out first? And if you're curious, uh, those are, let me, let me imagine, because this is my, friend's D, my friend DJ. I was friends with him in high school and I would go over to his house all the time. I imagine different cues that lead up to uh, his, his family's trailer. Um, so uh, the first one that we got, we got Dr. No. And then after that, uh, we got uh, From Russia With Love. After that, we got Thunderball. After that, 
we got um, uh, You Only Live Twice, and then after that, we got On Her Majesty's Secret Service, and then we got Diamonds Are Forever, and then we got um, uh, uh, Live and Let Die, and then we got The Man with the Golden Gun, and I could go on and on for all 20, 25 of them. Uh, but you get the idea that basically it would be much harder for me to try to remember a list of 25 James Bond movies um, in row instead of just easily placing cues around a very familiar environment that I can just mentally walk through. If this is sounding confusing, you can check this out in a video right here, which I would encourage you to do. I think it's a really cool video. And in my cognitive psychology class, we actually use uh, his video to remember the first 100 digits of pi. That's a lot of numbers that are all very particularly in a row that don't repeat. The first 100 digits will be really hard to remember by themselves. But if you can make it interesting and meaningful to you and put it in a place that's familiar to you, then you stand a pretty good chance of remembering it. That's all that I have time for here. Sorry, I went a little bit longer than I, than I was hoping that I would, but I know I kind of sped through these things. And hopefully you find some of those videos, maybe something caught your ear that you want to check out a little bit more of. Check out those videos. Check out some of those exercises I told you about um, and, and test your own memory and see how that goes. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, next chapter, we're going to be talking about developmental psychology and how behavior changes over the span of our lives. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I will catch you in the next video. Bye-bye.